Summit. Um, this year's theme is suicide prevention through community partnerships. So, as a veteran myself, I know firsthand that it takes more than just the VA to spread awareness for suicide prevention. It takes a whole community to spread the awareness. And that's what our goal is here today. We hope that through our presenters, you learn something new. Through the veterans panel, you listen to stories of recovery. And through the vendors, you discover new resources. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our ceremonial. And we wanna take time to thank Beaumont Air Force JROT, Beaumont High School Air Force JROTC Color Guard as they present the colors. Now singing the national anthem is Miss Anita Porter, LVN Emergency Department Navigator. Please join me in singing our nation's national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land Thank you, Ms. Porter. And now leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance is Adonai Silva, who is a peer support specialist here at Loma Linda VA. Good morning. At this time, please remove any covers, place your hand over your heart, and please follow along with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, and once again, I wanna thank the Beaumont High School Air Force JROTC Color Guard for that, um, as well as Miss Anita Porter and Adonai Silva. Now, uh, next up will be our mental health chaplain, uh, Chaplain Vincross, for our invocation. We pause in this moment to still our hearts and our minds, to take some deep breaths. and to acknowledge the challenges that we face. Challenges to our mental health, to our spiritual well-being. There are griefs, wounds, traumas, both known and secret. There are those of us in this room who struggle with suicidal thoughts, with depression, with anxiety, with intrusive traumatic memory, and the loss of a sense of self, and of security, 
and continuity in this world. Many in this room today reach out to support others who face these things every day, even as we encounter our personal struggles. We acknowledge the difficulties we face with systems of care that do not live up to what we hope for, even as we strive to make them better. There are those in this room who feel burnt out. We pause to acknowledge that pain, discouragement, and exhaustion. We also pause to acknowledge the hope that fills this room, the sources of strength and encouragement that we draw upon. We look in this moment to our higher powers, our sources of inspiration, of love and kindness, of sacred and the holy. We lift our hearts in gratitude for those who have paved a way before us, who hold our hands, even as we reach out to offer our hands to others. As we face these great challenges before us, we invoke a blessing upon our gathering today. May we share some of the light with one another. May we be inspired. May we find encouragement. May we grow this day and take strength for this moment. May blessings be upon us today. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Vincross. So as we begin with our welcoming remarks here, uh, we just want to once again thank you all for being here. Uh, it's it's quite interesting meeting in person again, I know for us. Uh, there's lots of new challenges with this, but we appreciate your patience um, Anna, we're in working with us. Uh, we also want to remind you that today's event is going to be recorded, and so we do plan on putting it on our uh, on the YouTube channel along with our previous year's mental health summits. So for all the speakers, everybody that's in here, just know that your words are going to work are going to reach so many more ears than just what's in this auditorium. I think it's always helpful to keep that in mind. So as we move forward, we want to take time to also thank uh, those with leadership that are here. Uh, you know, I know Carmen and I and our team when it came to planning this. Uh, we we definitely needed that support, and so we want to take time to thank our executive leadership for being here, um, as well as the city of Redlands that was paramount in putting this on as well. Uh, so thank you guys very much, and we'll go ahead and continue on with our medical center director, Mr. Saron. Good morning, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues, I want to welcome you to our annual mental health summit. It's so nice to be here in person after several years of meeting virtually during the pandemic. I'm truly honored to be standing here before you as the medical center director of this exceptional healthcare system, a place where compassion, dedication, and unwavering commitment to our nation's heroes are the heart of everything we do. But before I continue with my opening remarks, I'd like to take a moment and really applaud Carmen and Raymond uh, for spearheading today's mental health summit, along with the partnership and dedicated group of community partners you'll encounter today. It brings great pride to see the JROTC Beaumont High School cadets post the colors, to hear Miss Anita Porter's lovely voice from our ED, uh, while she sang the National Anthem, the Pledge of Allegiance, and of course, the invocation that was presented today. Um, one of the things that Chaplin mentioned was the traumas both known and in secret. That really resonates. Um, and I recall last year's virtual summit it was released on the National VA YouTube channel, just like this year's will be. And clinicians answered questions from moderators addressing common beliefs, misconceptions about mental health treatments and services, and it explored the many forms of therapy at VA Loma Linda. The visitation to the driving range for Lynx Group, a group in which veterans and VA providers gather to learn more about the game of golf, as well as engage in therapeutic interactions with one another in nature, a showcase of our talented veterans that participate in strings and creative writing groups. Strings, as you know, is a continuation of guitar for vets. And I just learned today that our chief of staff also plays guitar, which is pretty cool. Dr. Seacrest. Uh, guitar uh, the strings uh, is a group of veterans that gather to jam and partake in meaningful interactions out in the community. These are just a few of the highlights from our previous years. As we gather here today, it's important to recognize that September holds a special significance in our mission to care for those who have served. It's Suicide Prevention Month, a time when we focus our attention on one of the most critical challenges we face, preventing veteran suicide. 
This somber reality reminds us of the paramount importance of our collective efforts and reinforces our commitment to saving our saving veterans' lives. Veterans, those brave individuals who have selfless, selflessly defended our freedom, bear a heavier burden when it comes to mental health struggles and suicide risk compared to the general population. They've shouldered the weight of our nation's service, often at great personal sacrifice. But in their selflessness, they sometimes find it harder to ask for help when they need it most. That is precisely why our new public service announcement poses a powerful question. When was the last time you asked for help? Don't wait, reach out. This simple yet profound message serves as a poignant reminder to our veterans that seeking assistance is not a sign of weakness, but rather an act of immense courage and strength. On our website, va.gov backslash reach, there are resources that are available today. On that website, you can also find social media content to help spread the word to, to veterans in your life. Everyone can be a part of the solution and help save lives. Throughout the summit, you'll hear about ways to assist. If you're a veteran in crisis or concerned about one, contact the Veterans Crisis Line. It's a 24-7 confidential support service. You don't have to be enrolled in VA benefits or healthcare to connect. To reach responders, dial 988, then press 1. You can also chat online at veteranscrisisline.net or texting 838255. Today, as we gather to together to embark on a journey that is shared, a journey that demands our unwavering commitment to providing the support, understanding, and resources necessary to prevent veteran suicide. We're here to bridge the gaps and break down the barriers that prevent our heroes from accessing the care they deserve. Together, we'll build an unshakable foundation of hope, healing, and resilience. Throughout this mental health summit, we have the opportunity to engage in meaningful discussions, learn from experts in the field, and exchange innovative ideas that will shape the future of mental health care for our veterans here in Loma Linda. By fostering collaboration and learning, we can develop comprehensive strategies that address the unique challenges faced by our veteran community and empower them to live fulfilling lives. So as much as this is about veterans, it's also about our providers giving us feedback. How are we doing? What, what needs are, are going unmet and how can we help? I encourage each of you to actively participate, share your experiences, partake in all the resources that we're providing and extend the knowledge to your fellow veteran brothers and sisters and challenge the status quo. As leaders and advocates, we have a responsibility to be the driving force behind change. We have to ensure that no veteran feels alone, abandoned, or without the support they need. In closing, I know during your time in the military, it was instilled to watch each other's six. So let our great team here at Loma Linda help and watch your six. Enjoy your time at the summit and to our veterans. It's okay to ask for help. We're here to help you. Together, let us embrace this opportunity to ignite hope, instill resilience, and create a future where every veteran knows they're not alone, that help is just a call, a conversation, or a hand extent, extension away. Thank you, and may this Mental Health Summit be a catalyst for transformational change. I'll turn it back over to you, Ray. Thank you. And now the VA Loma Linda Chief of Staff, Dr. Seacrest. Hey, good morning. All right. Well, I, I feel better already. What a great event. I um, was so inspired to see, you know, those young individuals with those colors. Wasn't that amazing? And that inspirational rendition of, of the national anthem. Just great. I, I am grateful to be here. 2023 Mental Health Summit. Our coming together is an important step, an important step towards really one of the highest priorities in healthcare, which is suicide and suicide prevention in a veteran population. No question about it. One of my highest, highest priorities. It's a complex issue, though. And that's why, you know, in Navy speak, we need all hands. We need all hands on deck for this complex issue. Because we need a coalition of individuals, agencies, organizations to come together around a common mission. Common mission, simply stated, is, is a community coming together to, to create that, that safety net. That safety net for veterans in crisis, protect them, 
and it requires coordination. Coordination of the collective resources represented in this very room and beyond come together to create that safety net. And comprehensive strategies to really, really organize and impact countless lives today, tomorrow, the future. It also requires creativity. You got to think out of the box sometimes. Every situation is different and unique, and that's where innovation comes in. That's why this is a marketplace of ideas that, that I value tremendously and look forward to participation. And of course, the continuous commitment. It's about not just the partnerships, but sustaining and, and continuance of all of the hard work that is put forward to sustain this. So with today's summit, you're going to hear from experts. We're going to celebrate progress. You're going to learn about, I'm sure, the challenges and the barriers that are before us. We're going to review and discuss resources that are available, best practices. We're going to chart a path forward. We're going, to, we're going to find a way to move forward to the ultimate goal, which is not a problem anymore. So thank you for your commitment, for your willingness to learn your determination to take meaningful action by your presence here today and to those of you who joined us online. Well, let's begin the summit with an open heart, open mind. Let's keep that commitment, that communication, that collaboration going, and let's come together and affect positive change. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have the Acting Chief of Mental Health, Dr. Davis. Right. Good morning, esteemed Good morning. guests. Oh, I love it. Passionate. I admit, uh, you guys are in for quite the treat today. I kind of think of this as like a potluck, in a sense. Anybody like a potluck? You know, where we get all the food together? I'm a big fan of that, right? So right now, you're getting, getting the celery appetizer. That's what I am, celery appetizer. But today, <laughs> later on, throughout the day, you're going to get the good stuff, the meat, right? Uh, well, unless you're vegetarian, then we'll have a tofurkey or something for you. Don't sweat it. We got variety. Uh, so I'm Luther Davis, Acting Chief of Mental Health, uh, and I just am excited about this year's Mental Health Summit. It's great to see you in person this year. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind when I think about suicide prevention, we always have all these taglines and slogans, right? And one is that suicide prevention is everybody's business. But that's so much more than just a tagline or a slogan. It's a reality. Um, you know, when you look at population health research in general, in healthcare, we talk a lot about things like social determinants of health, you know, and how a lot of morbidity and mortality uh, when it comes to healthcare, uh, the, the things that disable us or result in premature death are driven by social factors and social determinants, not by healthcare. And so, as a VA organization, uh, we do a lot of cool things. I'm going to share a few with regard to suicide prevention. Uh, but the reality is the bulk of suicide prevention is here. It's you. Um, it's your ability to touch people when they need it. Uh, a few things that's going on in the VA right now that I'm very excited about. Uh, first off is the Compact Act, and you're going to hear more about that. Uh, we're in the early phases of rolling that out and interpreting that locally, so we'll, we'll get it all sorted out pretty quick. Uh, but the Compact Act is wonderful as it allows for veterans who are in suicidal crisis uh, to have unprecedented access and eligibility for care related to that suicidal crisis to ensure that eligibility barriers are not what they once were. So you'll hear more about that. And that is a, a, a thrilling opportunity, I think, um, for us locally. In terms of a mental health service, we're really excited about what we've been able to offer and grow over time. Over this past year, we've added uh, right around 100 new staff to improve access to care. Three of those new staff are suicide prevention coordinators to help manage and case manage all of our veterans who are experiencing a difficult moment and are uh, at risk for suicide. Uh, in fact, we were looking at the data recently, and I'm proud to report that our suicide prevention team tracks more veterans than anybody in the nation, anywhere, any other VA. So I think we're about 15th, 18th, 16th, somewhere in that ballpark in terms of the size of the VA, number one. 
number of veterans tracked for high risk for suicide. And again, and yet, even with all of that, 90% of the work is in your court. Suicide prevention isn't just seeking care. It isn't just screening for suicide. You know, it's it's much more. It's simple things. It's, and I get a loan when I need a loan for my home. And I get advocacy whenever uh, I'm advocating for service connection due to a disability. It's little things. I mean, there's research in suicide prevention that show that a sense of belongingness is one of the key predictors of whether or not someone dies by suicide. So think about your organizations. What do you do to promote a sense of belongingness? There's so much that, that we can do as an organization, as a VA, and and to help our veterans and bring them in, bring them to us. We're going to do our best to make sure we give them the best care anyway. But you're the front line. Critical. That's why we're having this summit. I mean, it might be for coffee and snacks a little bit, but mostly it's to send this message to you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. And now the Acting Deputy Associate Chief of Staff for Mental Health, Ms. Sharice Blurick Guzman, LCSW. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and advocates for mental health. I'm Sharice Blurick Guzman, your Acting Deputy Chief of Mental Health. I'm also a spouse of a Marine, and a Loma Linda social worker for the past 15 years. I stand before you today with a profound sense of purpose and optimism as we gather for this mental health summit. This momentous occasion represents an opportunity for us to come together to engage in candid conversations and to chart a path towards a brighter and more compassionate future for mental health. In a world that is constantly evolving, it's paramount that we prioritize the well-being of our minds and the minds of those around us. Mental health is not a niche concern. It's a fundamental aspect of the human experience that touches each and every one of us. It transcends age, gender, race, and socioeconomic status. It's impacting individuals on a global scale. Today, we embark on a journey to acknowledge the challenges, stigma, inequities that surround mental health. And we are here to challenge the status quo, to break down barriers and to foster an environment where an open dialogue is not just encouraged, but celebrated. The Mental Health Summit is a platform for voices to be heard voices to be shared, sorry, stories to be shared, and solutions to be explored. Over the course of the summit, we will hear from experts and advocates, individuals with lived experience who will share their wisdom and inspire us with their resilience. We'll discuss critical, the critical role of accessible mental health care and the importance of destigmatization and the power of community support. Let us remember that mental health is not a destination, but a continuous journey. It requires ongoing commitment, compassion, and collaboration. In my work with recovery, I rely heavily on community relationships to provide a safety net for our most vulnerable veterans recovering from substance abuse. I've seen firsthand the transformation that occurs when we have the trust of our veterans to care for them in their darkest of days. They're able to free themselves from addiction and seek gainful employment and re-engage with family and new friends. Just the other day, our mental health staff shared with me how the single simple power of just listening and being present help save a veteran from taking his life. Because of compassion and commitment, three little girls still have their father today. And this veteran has an opportunity to begin again.
Together, we have the power to transform lives, to empower individuals, and to strengthen communities. I'm honored to be here today to be a part of this gathering, and I encourage all of you to actively engage, learn, and contribute. My hope for today is that we all walk away with someone new in our network, a new resource that we can call upon. Thank you for your dedication and compassion and presence here today. I'm confident that together we can make an impact on veterans' mental health. Right. Well, once again, we want to thank our leadership for your welcoming remarks. Appreciate having you guys here. So now to lighten things up a little bit. For everybody that registered and has a registration bag, we encourage you to check your bag. We went ahead and pulled a uh, golden ticket thing. It's not quite a golden ticket that's in there, but it is a Starbucks gift card. I think we have 10 of them, right, Carmen? There should be about 10 of you that got Starbucks gift cards. If we end up with less, that just means <laughs> that we'll, 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 we'll get them distributed. Um, we tried to make sure that we put them in bags that were gonna be handed out. So um, yeah, hopefully you find that in there. Uh, there's also lots of other great information in there uh, as far as community resources, as well as VA phone numbers, uh, helpful numbers like that, and stress ball, because we could all use stress ball. I know I can. So. With that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Carmen. So we want to welcome our first presenter. If we can change the slide, please. Um, so please help me welcome Lisa Roybal, AMBETS Department, California co-chair from AMBETS One for her AMBETS One presentation. Good morning again to all of you. I see some of you are still looking for the golden ticket. Anybody get the golden ticket? All right, we got a couple of three, oh, four people in the room, fantastic. Again, my name is Lisa Roybal. I'm a retired uh, Navy Nurse Corps, um, retired in 2004. Um, I served 20 years and, you know, there wasn't enough, right? Then I had to volunteer and I volunteer for AMBETS, Department of California. Um, I am gonna be talking to you about our innovation of AMBETS One, but AMBETS is a veteran service organization that is proudly has a history of serving veterans for over 76 years. So it's my honor to talk to you about this mission we embarked on, um, that we wanted to really share the veteran suicide crisis with our community partners. If you've already heard, there's a common theme here this morning that uh, we can't do this alone. Everyone has to be involved. It's not a VA, it's not a DOD, it's not a veteran service organization issue. It's an American issue. So in August of 2021, I happened to be attending the national conference for AMVETS and I heard about the AMVETS rolling to remember. It's held in Washington, DC every year in Memorial Day. And it brings out, a, it's one of the largest motorcycle rally in the United States. And it brings people together to raise awareness for a couple of common causes. One is we still have 82,000 service member unaccounted for that haven't come home. And on also, the, we are trying to fight for that real solution for this veteran suicide crisis. So at that conference, I asked my state commander, I said, hey, can we send a couple of representatives to California out there? What do you think I heard? There's no money. Okay, there's no money. So we stood in the back for a while. There's about five or six of us and we started brainstorming. We said, well, we can take our cars, we can caravan across and we, everywhere we stop, we're just gonna send, throw out the swag for veteran suicide crisis. Then we went to, let's get an RV. Let's get an RV, that sounds better. Then we're all in the same vehicle and we can work out this together. Then in January of 2022, we went to one of our uh, state meetings. We met the department's marketing um, expert, Lance Cordoza. And he stated, what are you guys doing? Why don't you go big or go home? And we're like, what does that mean? He says, let's lease a 45 foot motor coach, as you can see in the picture there, and make it a, a billboard that'll go across the country. And we went, oh, wow, how do we do that? 
Well, first our journey was we needed to hit the bricks and start fundraising so that we could take this seed of an idea and make it really happen. So in May of 2022, members of the AMVETS Department of California launched their first tour across America to spread awareness for veteran uh, suicide crisis throughout the state and across the country. And we called it AMVETS One. We took a take on Air Force One, you know, so but it, it worked. Our tagline is, what do we know? We leave no, leaving no veteran behind, providing healing, hope, and honor. These dedicated vol volunteers really uh, we met, we meet, and we still meet every week for an hour on Wednesday. And we've been doing that since January of 2022. We go dark for a couple weeks after a tour because we're tired of each other. And then at Christmas. So, um, but, you know, this AMVETS one really was designed to engage members of all veteran service organizations, not just AMVETS, and get the community involved to reduce the stigma and really highlighting local resources as we went across to the different cities to prevent veteran suicide through earned media. What does that mean? Well, we had that marketing man. He was not a veteran, by the way, but he joined us. He's a high, I mean, he does entertainers, everybody came on because he was passionate. He made sure that we had ABC, NBC, Fox, any local news, any local um, uh, interviews, we did it all. And through that earned media, we knew that's how we could reach more people. Our first tour across America rolled out on May 23rd, 2022, and we did a 10 city tour in a 45 foot motor coach. In fact, Loma Linda VA was one of our stops on that tour. Um, and you could see that that motor coach was pretty impressive. We had, um, and we arranged those medias at each stop. We used Facebook Live. so. We were um, getting out there to anybody that was watching the department's Facebook. So lessons learned, 10 cities killed us. Um, it was a bear, but we made it to DC, all intact. There was one person we wanted to throw off early on, but he's made it to the end. And the AMVETS members, we met many, hundreds of AMVETS members, writers at the nation's capital. We handed out suicide prevention, materials. We arranged speakers, like I said, on a way not only AMVETS mem members were speaking, but every city we stopped at, we had government officials or we had community partners that were passionate about prevention so that the local news carried what was available in their, in their city. So we actualized this idea and we witnessed firsthand the success of AMVETS One inaugural tour across America. We reached over 31 million people with earned media. Thanks for the overwhelming community support for this awareness and advocacy and effort. We recognize that we have an opportunity really to build on this momentum of AMVETS One. And we repeated the fundraising all over again to do it again in May of 2023. This continues really to solidify our position as really being the tip of the spear, trying to find ways to involve our community and serve better those that have served. When we build more awareness, and that's through all of us, right? We will proactively save lives. We will save lives. AMVETS One has been self-sustaining mobile resource hub. It utilizes technology, peer support, and tapping into those local networks to offer the spectrum of responses that are needed in that community. So AMVETS One has traveled this great nation. At each stop, we provide that pro programming and outreach. And the motor coach displays information that is, is that really helps us tell us what our mission is and access to information for veterans in the crisis line using our QR code. And you can see our QR code is pretty big. So it's highly visible even when you're moving. We look out the motor coach, we see people hanging out the windows, taking pictures. We're hoping they're videoing us. We're hoping they're posting it. We're hoping they're accessing our QR code. So it's good for anybody that has a smartphone or has a camera on their phone, they can take a picture of it. We witnessed firsthand in both tours when we we're looking out, seeing everybody really interested or when we stop at the gas stations and we get an opportunity to talk to people. I mean, we're just not going in for snacks. We're looking for our veterans. We're talking to people along the way. In fact, in our Denver tour, in the 2023, one of our 23 stops, 
we were escorted 30 minutes out, out outside the Denver city limits by the Denver police. And we were big stuff, people moving out of our way. And once we got in the city limits, they had to blow a hole. So people were literally like the, the, the sirens were going and people were moving over so the bus can come through. And people were hanging out the windows who wondering who the heck we were that we had this kind of um, escort. The technology was selected widely because it's understood. COVID was great. QR code. I don't know. My parents didn't know what it was. Now my parents whip out their phone at a restaurant. Oh, it's a QR code. That's where the menu is. So people it was a familiarity for people. So the name AMVETS one really highlights that we're all in this together. Our brothers and sisters in arms, our solution capitalized on name recognition. And when we launched our tour in 2022, it helped us solidify that name. It employs a multidisciplinary approach, identifying those vulnerable veterans before they reach that crisis point. That's our goal. We provide uh, the veteran, the veteran families, the community with the tools and resources to address the challenges and barriers. The veterans are fully integrated really into the social fabric. When we go into their city, they know what's available for them and it helps them hopefully fill what they need to do now that they're in their civilian role. Our goal is to do more than save lives in that moment. It's really to ensure that they never arrive at that moment, right? We wanna catch it before it happens. A prime example was this young man who was contemplating suicide on our first tour. He heard the radio broadcasts that we were coming into town where we were stopping and he showed up at our, at our um, media stop. He came up to us, he told us his story. We connected him to the services that were available in his city because they were there at that area stop. Not only do we think we saved his life, he is now helping others in crisis. Or when we were on our tour in Denver in 2023, we had our guest speaker was a uh, prior active duty army first sergeant who lost his son to suicide while he was still active duty. And while he was speaking, I watched the, I always kind of watched the audience because things can be triggering. I watched this young man get up. I could tell he was crying. He moved off to the side. I followed him. While his back was turned, I just put my hand on his back. I just wanted him to know he wasn't alone. He opened up to me and said he had been deployed a couple times and he hadn't dealt with his mental health issues. I listened to him. I validated his experience, but then I connected him to the services he needed. I hope that day, well, I am still in touch with him. He's still, he's okay. He's gotten his services at the VA. But this is how we save one person at a time, paying attention, looking around. In, 20, in the 2023 tour, we used our prior ex um, experiences to really pare down. We went from 10 cities because we were very uneducated to six. It was so much doable. We took a different route to DC this time, so we had a whole different set of cities. Nearly all the team on board are veterans. And we know firsthand the challenges the servicemen and women face beyond their active due time in the military. Through the volunteer roles, including AMVETS leadership, who are also on board, and participating in initiatives with AMVETS One, we deeply understand the existing gaps that we have, the knowledge and the resource in the community that can cause that veteran to slip through the cracks. So between our AMVETS tour May of 2022 and May of 2023, it really provided the insight that it works. And it's really an opportunity to pilot the idea on a large scale. I mean, who thought we would be doing this? We were going in a car and the next thing I'm we're in on is a 45 foot bus. These two tours had unique opportunities to walk with the veterans and their families in the communities through our media coverage and up close and personal conversations we had with them on our tour. In 2023, we actually started in our state capital, which is really super cool. And then the Utah governor thought, you know, cause we, we reached out big, trying to let people know we were coming into their cities that we actually parked, they brought us, this is the one on the bottom. We were actually in front, no cars there. They opened the gates so the bus could move on. We parked it right there in front of the Capitol and we had our media coverage there. Based on the experience, we really have tapped into really also the existing infrastructure that we have in AMVETS. And we have those infrastructures in all of our veteran organizations um, where we have hundreds of members, we have volunteers, we have people engaged in the community. 
that are invested in suicide awareness and prevention and the resources that are across the nation. When you see one suicide resource, you really only see one. We've really seen a lot going across country. We, this last tour, we were um, very lucky to engage with two large companies, Texas Roadhouse and Honeywell, who have a veterans division who were our sponsors this last time around. One of many sponsors actually. So if you utilize technology, we can re reduce barriers. Um, and we know that we said that this is not just an AMVETS, a VA, DOD, it's everyone's issue. And engaging with the community really addresses those factors, those social determinants that you talked about of health and well-being of our veterans, really figuring out what they are and reaching those veterans that where they are, right? We want to go where they are, you know, um, the, giving them the right care, the right time and being in the right place. So AMVETS 1 is intended to serve all veterans just by the nature of it being mobile. The first tour of AMVETS 1's mission was successfully completed. It allowed us to launch an idea and determine where, whether it was effective or it should be replicated. And as you know, we did replicate it in May of 2023. We achieved what we set to do to build that momentum and awareness within AMVETS in our community about the importance of this issue, our ability to make impact together, and we recognize we need to continue to do more. Our two national tours across America are under our belt now. And now we are embarking on calling um, our next tour, AMVETS One, the Golden State Tour. So why wouldn't we take care of our state? It started in the state of California. So now we are um, launching our first Golden State Tour from Southern to Northern California, starting on the 8th of November in Long Beach. Then we're heading off to Santa Barbara. And then we're going to Travis Air Force Base. They can't wait for us to be there. Reading, Chico, and Visalia, where we'll be ending on the 12th of November. There will be veteran resource fairs established at every one of those stops with our veteran service organizations, our community partners, and government officials. While simultaneously, we're planning our next tour to the Capitol in 2024. This team of dedicated veterans engaging in this motor coach tour across America and California is passionate. We're deeply committed to saving lives through suicide awareness and prevention and the efforts ongoing across the nation. This proven enterprise is saving lives. The mission of leaving no veteran behind or saving one is paramount. We have taught the, we taught the easiest tool going across um, our tour and it's the VA SAVE acronym, right? Why wouldn't we use that? It's so simple. S stands for know the warning signs of suicidal thinking. Look for hopelessness, feeling like they have no way out, anger and rage, engaging in risky behaviors, maybe even increasing their alcohol or drug use, just to name a few. So that's the S. The A is ask that important question. Are you thinking of killing yourself? And if you don't feel comfortable saying that, are you thinking of suicide? Have you had thoughts of taking your life? Whatever it is, do remember to ask that question and make sure it flows as natural as you can through a conversation. Don't leave that part out. That's the A. Ask the question. The V stands for validate the veteran's experience, right? Use those supportive, encouraged comments while you're talking to them. Do not pass judgment. Reassure them that help is available. And then the E is encourage treatment. Expedite getting help. Do not leave that veteran alone. Do not keep their suicide thoughts a secret. You can dial 988 press one and get that veteran help on the spot. Since the inception, these dedicated volunteers that worked tirelessly to keep this mission going have committed their own funds. So those of us that ride on the bus, when we fundraise, we fundraise to get us from point A to point B. So the, our food comes out of our pocket. And you can see, well, they caught me midair, but this one on the top shows you that where it's a 12 bunk motor coach and I had the very top bunk and I was trying to get something off of it and I was climbing up it even in heels to get what I needed. But we, if we got tired of being on there, we wanted a hotel room, we paid that for out of our funds. Wherever the bus ended in DC, we flew our own selves back home. That's commitment, that's commitment. The quarters are tight, so seven days together, 
and addressing heavy topics of suicide prevention is taxing on our own mental health, but we lifted each other up every evening. What an absolute privilege it was to see this concept take flight. We gained notoriety through AMVET's family across the nation. We have won awards for our innovation, but more importantly, we met community partners across America that have passion for ending suicide for veterans. It's important that we engage with our community. It is impossible to be solution-based without community. Veterans are killing themselves in isolation every day. We need everybody watching for warning sign. It is really imperative. We do have our vendors out front, and I do have a table if you want to talk to me about the mission. I'm happy to talk to you. I have flyers about our next tour. If you want to stop at one of those cities that we're going to be at, it's going to be magnificent. And I want to thank you for all that have and are continually serving. We want everyone to know you matter. Thank you. Thank you. So up next, we have from the Riverside County Suicide Prevention Coalition, uh, Ms. Kelly Smith, and she is the Injury Prevention and Trauma Education Coordinator. There's more on there, but I'm going to let you describe it because I know you're going to do a better job than I am. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, everybody, so much for having me here. I'm thrilled to be able to be able to present at this um, summit. It is my first summit, so bear with me here. So, but I am excited. Um, my name is Kelly Smith. I've been a registered nurse for uh, since 2009. I've worked my entire career at Riverside University, the health systems, the medical center. It's a big trauma uh, level one adult center there. Um, so I worked in the ER for most of it. Uh, saw a lot of trauma, a lot of people and family members affected by suicide and know the importance of it. Uh, recently in the last year and a half, I have transitioned in trauma services, doing community outreach and nurse trauma nurse coordinating, where I have collected over the last year and a half, many, many um, resources and uh, great things that we wanna be able to offer to all of our patients and I wanna offer to you as well. So um, with that being said, I normally teach, I engage the community with stop the bleed classes, car seat classes, fall prevention class, all kind of classes. So I do have a PowerPoint, not just a speech for everybody. I apologize, but I won't tell you with the PowerPoint only. So, um, but I am very passionate about reducing injuries, increasing safety and awareness. Um, so I also am a trauma survivor coordinator, um, which we'll kind of go over that and what that entails and a nice little source of resources for everybody. Ding. So um, I'm here to represent our Suicide Prevention Coalition. I am proud to be part of Riverside County um, and the coalition that they have created. We all know that suicide prevention and awareness is not just a siloed endeavor. We know that it's a multidisciplinary, multi-faceted um, approach to be able to prevent and reduce suicide with coalitions, much like this microphone is amplifying my voice, a coalition and par partnerships are gonna be able to amplify our message, which is to uh, promote uh, building hope and resilience. Too tall, okay. So uh, with our collaboration with our many community partners, including I work just like as Lo Melinda does, but uh, Riverside University Health Systems is part of a huge health system that has a medical center which is the hospital itself. We have public health, which has a lot of community outreach and stuff. We have behavioral health, which has clinics everywhere throughout the Riverside County. And we also have our community counties as well, our clinics. So we have also collaborated with the County of Riverside, our Take Action for Mental Health, and of course with the VA as well. So our Suicide Prevention Strategy Plan is a framework which provides layers of energy Interventions to provide a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention. So we know that there's many building blocks and puzzle pieces to be able to help really integrate um, and have a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention. Um, we all want to just eat the pie all by itself in one sitting, but we know that it's a very big pie to be able to eat. So we want to be able to break it down into subgroups and stuff like that to be able to really focus um, efforts. And that's kind of what we've done here. So we take a 
universal approach, which means we uh, strengthen our protective factors, we increase confidence in our community to recognize the warning signs. We, I've heard many times that it is us, the community, the people um, that are recognizing these signs and symptoms of suicide and being able to really talk to our family members, our coworkers, our community about uh, signs, resources that may be available, stuff like that. Those conversations can be very difficult to have. So our universal um, part of our uh, coalition really works on that outreach and educating. We, we offer a lot of classes online, virtually, as well as in person on how to have conversations with our family members, how to recognize the signs and symptoms of suicide and how to get that out to our community. Our selective group um, focuses on high risk individuals by establishing effective screening tools and protocols that help strengthen protective factors and reduce our risk factors. They fo focus on certain groups that are at high risk, such as first responders, our healthcare providers, our military personnel. And then our indicated are gonna be those people that are really the ones that are actually suicidal, having thoughts, are very depressed. And so they um, often have programs and initiatives focused on to reduce their, their um, that, that population there. So our upstream group, they really uh, work on building an infrastructure. So they are the ones that have created the uh, Injury prevent, or excuse me, the uh, suicide prevention coalition. They're the ones that maintain that coalition, um, and give us also. They also provide a bunch of support groups, peer support groups. They make sure that we have our clinics in place and all of these um, resources available to where we can go to. They also uh, promote the resiliencies by really integrating activities into our community-based services. They they offer life skill classes and trainings including like mindful practice, mindfulness practices, critical thinking, stress management, conflict resolution, problem solving, and coping mechanisms, which I think we all could use, right? Whether we want to admit it or not. So, um, they also want to really expand the, the um, services to increase our mental health awareness. We have the prevention group, work group, which really focuses on the actual prevention of suicide. So um, they want to really, they have implemented programs to be able to foster emotional growth and connectivity. They assist schools with implementing different programs on uh, trauma-informed practices. Uh, we also have um, expanded and integrated suicide uh, prevention health services to ensure timely and thorough follow-up care and linkages to behavioral services. Uh, our I work for the trauma department at the medical center. So our in, in our way of promoting the um, knowledge of different resources and being able to provide it to our patients is by entering into what's called the Trauma Survivor Network. So this is a huge nationwide um, network of different hospitals that offer resources to our patients in a one-stop shop. We all know that there's a ton of stuff out there for everybody, but nobody knows where to go to find everything. So we provide little brochures here. It takes them to our website that shows them um, the Trauma Survivor Network, which has all of our different um, resources available in one stop shop. So we, we know our patients that have ex um, experienced a traumatic uh, event, has a, a 35 to 40% chance of having mental illness after that traumatic event. So we give them these resources to be able to follow up. It includes a lot of our behavioral health programs, including Take My Hand, which is a great um, texting and talking peer support type of uh, initiative and group. We have our um, all of our, off, anything from um, drug and alcohol uh, counseling and, and groups to, we also have the VA crisis line on there for our veterans, any, or anxiety, depression. So it's all one stop shop. So they get discharged from our hospital. We offer this brochure. We tell them to go to the website. Hopefully that there's some good resources that they can find to help with their, help prevent them from deteriorating even worse. So then we have intervention subcommittees and work plans. This is to increase our safe reporting of suicide. 
with the help of uh, social media. We do a lot of social media posts, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and stuff, just to be able to uh, really promote that uh, conversation of mental health, to promote our different classes that we offer. Uh, we do have a lot of training, not only towards the public, to be able to uh, teach them how to talk to uh, people and their peers about suicide, but also to help with the talking to our uh, providers. Sometimes that conversation could be kind of uh, uncomfortable to really sit down and speak to somebody about it. So we have training designed to be able to um, teach our first responders and other personnel how to uh, talk to them better. And then finally, in our intervention subcommittee work plans, we have uh, mean safety. So that is to really disseminate uh, information to our caregivers, family members on how they can support a person at risk, including reducing the environmental risk by promoting mean safety. We want to create uh, safe environments by reducing the access to lethal means. So we use the public health model to evaluate risk and identify methods of su suicidal behaviors developed and tailored means to restriction, restriction strategies and evaluate the impact of them. That's where the VA comes in. And then of course, we, have, we also have a post-intervention group work plan. So those people that have actually been affected by suicide loss we have uh, designed some peer support groups and um, classes to be able to assist them as well. And then we, of course, uh, uh, um, monitor all the data, evaluate it, reassess, and um, promote promote and provide different uh, suicide prevention strategies. So we have uh, partnered with our VA to uh, launch a um, gun lock initiative throughout our county here. So everybody received a gun lock in their bag there. This is through our veterans crisis hotline and stuff. So we found that um, our social workers, our clinic staff, our providers are all asking our at-risk patients if they do have um, any uh, lethal means of suicide in their homes, many of which say yes, um, but then we don't have anything to provide them to uh, offer follow-up care with that. So we're kind of just show them where they can do safe storage and stuff, but sometimes that is a very expensive means to it. So now we have put these gun locks in the hands of our social workers so that they can then offer it to our patients that are at high risk right there. And no questions asked. They don't have to fill out anything. Here is a free confidential gun lock or firearm lock that also has the signs and symptoms of suicide. The hotline is on there as well. That way they can just be able to provide that to our patients so that we feel better knowing that they have something. And if it's not just to our patients, then it's to their family members too that may be experiencing that crisis. So um, we also are providing uh, different ways of talking about how to talk to our patients about lethal means. Um, firearms and suicide, and are the five things that medical professionals need to know for that. So um, one is just a 25-minute presentation where they can just go on, on and kind of get better tools to be able to talk to our uh, patients about it. And the other one is an actual one-hour long uh, C. They can get continuing education credit for it. So this is, we've just got it. Um, approved through our administration, um, and now we're going to distribute it in a multidisciplinary um, approach. Not only I'm going to help with the medical center and distributing these gun locks to our social workers, our clinic staff, but also then behavioral health is going to help distribute it with our crisis teams that go out to people in crisis um, that may or may not have guns in the home and be able to provide those to them as well. So we're going to be distributing them to social workers, case managers, providers, the crisis team, clinic staff members, and who knows who else. Whoever else, um, as this program grows and expands, we're going to have new partnerships and stuff so that we can really get these gun locks in the hands of the families that really need them. How else can we distribute these or how, how we've done it um, is different community events. These are fun fun events where the community is out there and we could really engage them in speaking about signs and symptoms of suicide and then providing those locks in a very safe, free, judge-free um, environment there. We've been very successful at it, giving over like 150 gun locks in the two events that I've done so far. 
and I try to target the ones that are very specific to perhaps ones that have gun, guns in the home or that are, that are at high risk for um, suicide and depression, including ones for our public safety preparedness expo. So um, it's been very successful there, as you can see with that lady pointing at the gun locks that are on that side table there. Some upcoming events that we're going to be doing as well to really promote this program oops, is going to be the um, Veterans Expo that is happening down in Marietta, as well as we have a walk with us uh, to prevent suicide that our Suicide Prevention Coalition is um, conducting. And that there's going to be three different events. We'll target the one um, Inland Empire Walk, which kind of incorporate, incorporates all of the, the different areas and really be able to promote the signs and symptoms and how to talk to our people about suicide and then provide the locks. And then we have our annual conference coming up, um, Creating Hope Through Action. And so we will be showcasing this, um, our, our effectiveness of this program um, at that as well. And then we wanted to know, is this working? Does it help um, prevent suicides or make us feel better about giving them out? So we have a little post um, survey. So once a month, we'll be collecting it from our social workers and our providers and whoever else are handing out the gun locks to kind of gauge and, and see, is it working? Is there something we could do to improve it? Is, there, is it better? So we do have a, a tracking way, way to track it and get data from it. It just talks about if there's other needs in there, if they would like other trainings and stuff. So we can kind of gauge that. So this, this program is new. The partnerships are new. It's, um, but it is a key to the comprehensive successful um, effort to decrease the rate of suicide in our communities and stuff. So um, I thank you guys very much. Um, thank you. So, also other resources that Riverside University offers as well that I thought you guys might like is that we do have a free Narcan program that you guys can go to the e-emergency room without being a patient, without, being, without having any information, go there ask them for some Narcan, they will give you the training and the um, actual free Narcan there so that we can have it, okay? We know fentanyl uh, overdose is extremely high right now, so um, I have information on that, just as an extra little resource and tool that you put in your pocket that you hopefully you never have to use, but if you do have to use it, it's there for you. Okay, so I have that, and I also have, if you guys wanted information on the network, so thank you, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Mr. Cabrera, are we good? All right. So next, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Art Cabrera. He's a lead advanced MSA here with our community care program, and he's going to present some really helpful information about the VA's community care program. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we're running a little bit early. So if you just so happen to talk a little bit longer than you planned, we're, we're completely okay with it. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Will Mark Cabrera. Everybody that knows me, uh, you know, I go by art, long story, third grade and uh, Charlotte's Web. You know, that's where it all started. But uh, I, but I don't care now, you know. All right. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps, uh, Marine Corps Infantry for eight years. So, uh, you know, you know, I've used this I've used this program. Um, I really uh, I really enjoy working in the department as a veteran. And, uh, and I would say probably about 25% uh, of the people in our department are also veterans. So you, uh, you know, like we really care about helping, helping each other out, okay? Uh, so, if, you, know, if, you know, if you ever have any questions regarding anything, uh, hopefully it's about community care. If not, you can always call me and I'll point you in the right direction, okay? All right, so the first thing that we're gonna cover here is the Compact Act. Uh, it's the Veterans Comprehensive Prevention, Access to Care, and Treatment Act, okay? Oh, okay, got it. Uh, so the Compact Act is for eligible individuals. Uh, this new benefit covers emergence uh, suicide care associated with acute suicidal crisis. Uh, here, suicidal crisis. Uh, including emergency transportation, related medications, social work, and VA copays. Acute suicidal crisis, uh, individuals who is determined to be in uh, imminent risk of self-harm by a trained crisis responder or health or health care provider. Uh, so that'll cover up to 30 days inpatient 
for crisis residential care related to the acute suicide crisis. Uh, it'll cover up to 90 days medical and mental outpatient care related to the acute suicide crisis. And both these periods can be extended if, uh, if deemed uh, necessary, okay? So let's keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Uh, this eligibility applies to veterans as defined in Section 38 US, uh, USC 101. Uh, and just so you know, this may also include uh, individuals with other than honorable discharges, okay? Um, so, so those who were discharged or released from active duty after 24 months of active service under conditions other than dishonorable, uh, former members of the armed forces, including uh, reserve service members who served more than 100 days under a combat exclusion or in support of contingency operations, either directly or by operating uh, uh, aerial vehicles from another location who were discharged or released under condition is other than dishonorable, okay? It also includes former members of the armed forces who were the victim of physical assault of a sexual nature, battery of a sexual nature, or sexual harassment while serving in the armed forces. Um, and if you have like any questions regarding your, your specific eligibility, you, there's a, you know, you can always contact the VA eligibility department and they can help you out with that, okay? Or you can call community care and we can try to help you out, okay? Next slide, please. All right, so for the Veterans Crisis Line, as the director said earlier, um, you do not have to be enrolled in VA benefits. Uh, you, don't, you don't even have to even come here to the VA. Uh, if you feel that you need it, just give them a call. Uh, the number's right there, dial 988 with the option number one. Uh, you can even do it, you can do a chat if you don't feel like talking to nobody. Uh, you can go online and do it. There's all kinds of ways to do it. Uh, and obviously for the hearing and prayer, there's a number there as well, okay? Next slide, please. Okay, all, all auth so for emergency care, okay, all authorization, authorization inquiries and emergency visits, uh, Go to the centralized authorization for emergency care. You call that number. Um, a lot of the providers that we deal with, um, you know, I've used it before when I got in a motorcycle accident before. Um, they, they took me wherever they were going to take me. And uh, I told them, take me to the VA because I didn't want to have any bills. But they, they're like, no, man, you're not. You're, not, you're out of it. So, uh, so what, what, what they do is they automatically will notify the VA that you're there. Me, just to be safe, because I don't have a lot of money and I don't want to pay bills, I also make sure that I call. And uh, but whenever I call, they already know about it. So uh, just, you know, some information right there. Uh, if you have any billing questions, you can always call the patient advocate uh, or the number on the bill. Uh, or we have a, a VA customer service uh, claims and billing line. Uh, it's pretty, you know, I don't like dealing with bills, so I always just give them a call and uh, they help me out with whatever I need. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, so for the, com the next uh, Community Care Mission Act. Uh, next slide, please. So pretty much, um, it's called the Mission Act. I call it Community Care just because I've been doing this for so long. Um, I know a lot of people get confused. It's the same thing, okay? Um, so pretty much the way it works is uh, you talk to your VA provider. Uh, for whatever reason, the VA provider feels that you need to be seen by another specialty. They will enter a consult. The VA coordination team will review the request and see if it's something that the VA can handle in a timely manner or something that needs to be sent out to the community, okay? If it's something that needs to be sent out to the community, the, they will enter an authorization. Uh, that come to our department here, we will process your authorization, uh, you know, get with you on your preferences, all that good stuff, and then hopefully schedule you in, in a timely manner with an outside provider, okay? And all you have to do is attend your attend your visit with a positive attitude, and you're good. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so for the for the Mission Act eligibility, uh, so you it, it's for, it's supposed to be for services not available at the VA medic at VA medical facility. For veterans, uh, if the veteran lives in a U.S. state or territory without full service VA medical facility. Uh, and then the veteran qualifies under the grandfather provision related to distance. Um, under, it was under the choice program, okay? Um, so it also, if, if the VA cannot furnish the care within certain designated, designated access standards, 
or if you and your provider decide that it's in your best medical interest to be sent out to the community, okay? Or the VA, the VA, the VA service line does not meet the certain quality standards that uh, that all veterans deserve. Okay, this next slide right here shows you the what qualifies for drive time. I know it's uh, it's thirty minutes for your primary care and mental health, and it's sixty minutes drive time for other specialty clinics. Okay, um, right there has the the best medical interest, and that's between you and your provider for you to uh, discuss that. The wait time right there, 20 days for primary care and mental health. It's 28 days for specialty care. So it gives you the the drive time and the the, the services as well. Okay, the, the days. Okay. Slide, please. So when you and your provider decide, hey, you know what, we're going to go ahead and uh, we feel it's better for you to be seen out in the community. At that time, you and your provider will discuss your preferences, uh, such as. Uh, what day of the week you want to go? I know a lot of people work. Uh, how far you're willing to drive? Uh, for a lot of mental health, we uh, we do ask if you have a gender preference. I know some people uh, some people feel more comfortable with the with the late you know a female or a male provider, and uh, that's something that you would discuss with your provider at that time. That way, when we get the consult, it can just it can just expedite the process. Next slide, please. And if you ever uh, if you ever need to go to urgent care, there's obviously the next slide will show the the qualifications for urgent care. But this just gives you the VA website right here, and it's not just for VA urgent care. There's also um, providers on there. It's pretty pretty easy. If uh, if you ever need any help, just call community care, and anybody can help you navigate. But pretty much, you just fill in your uh, your spot right there with uh, what kind of services you're looking for. The one I've used it for is for for uh, urgent care. All you do is do the little drop down. You put what services you're looking for. You put your zip code, and then it'll give you your uh, the, the nearest facilities to your, where you're at. And those are guaranteed that work with the VA. Okay. Next slide, please. And then right here it tells you the the eligibility for uh, for urgent care is you have to be um, enrolled in the VA healthcare system, and you have to have been seen by your VA provider or a VA community provider within the last 24 months. What that means is that either the VA or somebody that, that the VA authorized you to be seen by within the last 24 months, okay? Um, if a veteran is asking if they are eligible, they can contact the community care, and our phone number's right there. It's 909-307-5248. Uh, you can also call the, eight, the 866 number, and then that's for, uh, for finding your pharmacies and you know fill urgent prescriptions, stuff like that, okay? Uh, one thing that I've uh, came across a lot lately is a lot of people that are going to school, stuff like that. They need to they need to have like a COVID test every week. Okay, that's something that is not covered under urgent care. Okay, the only way that would be covered is if uh, if you go into the clinic for you know you hurt your whatever, and your doctor says, hey, we want to make sure this gentleman or this person doesn't have a uh, COVID, then it would be covered if they ask for it. Okay, just to go get it, just for the fun of it, it's not covered. Okay, next slide. And also, uh, just to backtrack a little bit on that, on the VA locator, you can find all that stuff right there. Pharmacies, urgent care, um, there's all kinds of helpful information on there. Okay, so the way the pharmacy works is uh, the outside uh, physician will fax the prescription to the VA pharmacy. The VA pharmacy will fill the prescription and mail it to you, okay? Uh, if, it, if you're in the area or for something that you need right away, like you know, you're having some dental issues and you need some antibiotics right away, you can always bring the prescription in yourself. Uh, there does have to be a consult in place already, but if you're if you're doing all this, there's definitely are probably already a consult in. Uh, if it's narcotics or opioids, those must be hand carried into the pharmacy. Okay, slide please. Okay, and then if uh, if you want to see if you can get your flu vaccine, you can uh, you can call this number right here and you know follow the steps, or you can just walk over here to the lobby and get it done like I did. <laughs> Next slide, please. So uh, I'll I'll be here for like a little bit after the presentation. If you guys have any questions, I know I'm a little bit nervous and I'm probably speeding through this, but uh, but I'll stick around and I promise I'm a lot nicer one on one. All right. Um. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the veterans panel.
And I'll start off by introducing, I'm not going to read their entire bios, though they do both have great bios up there. Uh, so we'll start off by introducing our moderators. And uh, we're going to have Miss Gina Truitt. Gina is a LCSW. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's stand up. So Gina. <laughs> Uh, Gina is a licensed clinical social worker here at VA Loma Linda, and she is in the Women's Veterans. She's a Deputy Women Veterans Program Manager. It is a mouthful. Yes. Did we get that right, Gina? Got it right. right. Basically, an advocate for women veterans. There we go. <laughs> they couldn't ask for a better one. I've known Gina a long time, and she's an outstanding advocate. And then joining her with moderating is Mr. Andy Godoy. Mm -hmm. Andy Godoy. So Andy Udoy is an LCSW here at VA Loma Linda in the cardiology as well as the ALS clinic. Uh, so he does multiple jobs and he's here today to help carry the conversation that we're having with our veterans panel. And so our veterans that we have here today, we, we really want to express gratitude to the three of you. Um, we know that this isn't easy. It's not necessarily easy to come up and, and share your stories of recovery. Um, you know, we, we had an opportunity to talk to all three of you beforehand and, and kind of cover what we were looking for. And we, and we appreciate your willingness to be here. And, um, you know, we really hope that your stories can help motivate other veterans, other friends, family members, caretakers of veterans to know that recovery is definitely possible. It's not always easy, but it is possible. So first, I'd like to thank Ms. Amber Stuck. She is a U.S. Coast Guard veteran. Yes, thank you. Next, we have Mr. Paul James, who is a U.S. Army veteran. They have a seat now, if you'd like. And then finally, we have Mr. Will Torres, who is a United States Marine Corps veteran. So thank you, guys. So at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead if we want to. The light in your eyes. Yeah, we're going we're to cut the lights there. So, 100%. and so just again, as a reminder, uh, this is all being recorded. So keep in mind that this is going to go so far beyond uh, who's here in the auditorium. Uh, so once again, thank you guys for sharing your story. And I'm turning it over to Gina and Andy. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Patterns and and. And in, and for your health. So did did you did all of you have any health issues from related to this? Can you guys explain? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I was basically destroying like my stomach was just destroyed. I couldn't hold food down if I would. I mean, if I was awake and when I would eat, I would eat all the wrong things because you you know you kind of sedate yourself into like feel comfort. So you eat all the wrong things, comfort food. Um, it got to the point where I was in and out of um, the hospital because they thought it was one thing or another. And all it was is my system was just fighting to like keep going. And it just wasn't happening because I, if I was, if I was awake, I was just kind of zombied out mm -hmm. or I was asleep because I was over medicated. Yeah, it's, it's same thing. You know, I started gaining weight. I'm getting written up at work. You know, I'm about to lose my job. I'm on a probation period. Um, also, I'm isolating myself from those I love and, you know, and getting upset with them when I feel that they're isolating from me and just realizing that there's a pattern there and that, you know, I need to stop what I'm doing. And also, I'm gonna, if I continue down this downward spiral, things are just going to blow up right in front of my face. So those were definitely the red flags that I saw that kind of like helped me to step back and Look at myself a little more closely. I noticed that you guys uh, kind of mentioning different aspects of your life. Is it safe to say that it's not just one? It's not just the health. It's not just okay. working. What is that kind of like? What was that like at that time for you? <laughs> as far as working? Yeah, or trying to function in any other way. Um, well, for me, um, I was on actually I was actually on workers' comp when I started hitting my rock bottom and that was another problem and issue that I was dealing with because I had time on my hands and I had constant money coming in and so um, 
it was just a mental breakdown that I was experiencing and not realizing it. And as you said before, um, as far as going to the, the doctor and finding out you you have a fatty liver, you know, and um, and I was the opposite. I totally lost weight. I mean, I was really thin because I wasn't eating. All I wanted to do was drink. And um, and that brought on anxiety and panic attacks and and so on. So how did you access help? For me, it started outside the VA. Um, I had had a bad experience with a doctor. Uh, tried to do everything on my own at that point and couldn't. I really just, I, I felt like I was just circling and nothing was changing. Uh, so I started seeing a doctor outside of the VA who got me set up with like talk therapy. And at first it was kind of, I was like half in, it wasn't fully committed. And um, then it just got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to go all in for things to change. And did you, did you use the VA community care or did you use another insurance? I went through IHP. You went through IHP? Yeah. What about for you two gentlemen? So... I think getting out of the military, I had definitely had that young man mentality, you know, like, oh, I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. You know, I'll be OK. But it wasn't until I began to hit my late 20s that I was like, OK, something's got to give. And that's when I found writing like that was my outlet because I tried therapy. I tried, you know, religious cultural practices, you know, and it would just, you know, fill the void for a little while. But then I'm back to where I started. It wasn't until I wrote it down, you know, it made it made sense, made it make sense in my head to be like, okay, this is the problem. I share it with someone else. They help me give me feedback, constructive criticism. I connect the dots and then I'm like, okay, this is where I need to be. This is where I was and just start moving forward. So writing was definitely a good outlet for me. Wow, that's very interesting because I'm a writer as well. And um, writing has always been um, a part of me helping myself and just logging down what I'm going through and even to this date, I can go back to things that I wrote when I was 13 years old and look at it and like, wow. But um, what I did is um, I was calling a crisis hotline. I was calling a crisis hotline a lot <laughs> to the point where sometimes they would um, actually send out the paramedics for me and um, or the sheriff. <laughs> and um, so it was really a weird uh, situation. but. Um, it had got to the point where reaching out to my daughter and her getting tired of me calling her crying on the phone because that's what some alcoholics do. And um, so she also looked into the VA to get me help. And what wind up happening is we came down from 29 Palms to the emergency room. And that's where um, it all started for me from the emergency room I spent the night and then the next day I was sent to to Northeast which is the uh, mental health facility and that began my first term of recovery from there. Yeah, a common thing that I heard between the two of you and I don't know if you have any experience with this Ms. Stuck but uh, writing right and and it's a form of communication and I think a lot of times when people go through any kind of struggle, mental health or substance use or even both, it's hard to communicate, right? But part of what I think is really neat, you know, you're able to write your story for it to make sense for you, right? Make it make sense as you should, Mr. Torres, but then other people can read that story. And so what kind of motivated you to write about that versus other aspects of your life or other things? Well, for me, um, the writing aspect of it was beneficial for me, but it also gave me the mindset that if someone reads what I'm writing, maybe they're going through the same things that I'm going through. And nine out of, t well, you know, nine out of 10, you know, there's someone out there that's struggling with addiction or struggling with mental health or struggling with the thoughts of suicide. And I've struggled with all three of those, you know, pretty much my entire life. But um, so my writing was definitely um, a strength that I had and I use to put it out there because I have two books 
that that I've, I've written and um, and it's out there for others to read and to hopefully get something out of it. Absolutely, I 100% agree. Um, but also it was surrounding myself with a community of artists. You know, writing is definitely an art form. You know, photography is an art form. Painting, you know, poetry is all, you know, art form. And it's interesting how artists use their medium to, you know, take their trauma and put it into something that, you know, only they can understand, but it helps them to create and make sense of what they've been through so they can talk to it with others and share their story, whether it's in a photograph, whether it's in a poem, things like that. So definitely just getting that outlet, finding what it is, helps it easier for like for myself anyway, to talk about what I've been through with someone else. I think something else that you you had mentioned is that you were talking with your daughter. So did you guys have any family members or anybody who helped you navigate this mental health process? Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I've had, a I've had a ton of family support, um, but the big thing is, is, it's only useful when you accept it. Um, and I would throw up just guard, you know, just throw that, that guard constantly because there wasn't anything wrong with what I was doing. You know, I was just tunnel visioned on, I was doing everything right. Everybody else is wrong, not me. I was right. Um, and I think that also put a lot of strain on those relationships because, you know, it, it's exhausting for people to say, hey, you know, maybe you should, and maybe like, or anybody be like, no, no, I'm doing it right. No, you're wrong. I'm right. Um, and having that support to fall back on you know, when you finally like open your eyes and be like, oh, okay. Um, you know, it, you can't, you can't do it alone at all, ever. So it helps, uh, helps keep you uh, motivated to keep moving forward and keep, you know, doing the work. So what motivated you guys to keep doing the work? For you, it was your family, but my family. Um, yeah, for me, um, absolutely my family. Um, having my back, supporting me, wanting me to do better, be better, because they knew it was in me to be better and do better. Um, my longtime friend for over 20 years, you know, that's always had my back, you know, and um, I mean, that could almost bring a tear to my eye, but, um, you know, I just appreciate the um, support from her and from my, um, from my daughters, you know, to um, look out for their dad and really love me and, and be concerned about me. And then, um, of course, my, ca my case workers with the VA uh, was very supportive, very, very supportive. And uh, one of my old case workers are over there and, um, wow. And um, she's not my caseworker anymore. <laughs> I already mentioned my daughter, but my, my caseworker as well, that has, um, that was very beneficial for me um, getting through, you know, to my recovery. Yeah, for me, it was definitely my nieces and nephews. You know, I come from a family where, you know, our, our history is definitely rooted in alcohol and drugs. And I see that taking happening amongst my own, my brothers and sisters. And there was a quote I read not a couple years back where it said, I know, I can't remember who said it, but it was be the role model you wish you had when you were younger. Mm -hmm. And so I see that I take that powerful in, statement and I see them, you know, and I see how vulnerable my brothers and sisters were to fall down that downward spiral and I look at them and I'm like, I'm not going to let this happen to you guys. You know, I want to try to be that good role model that you guys need and know, see that there's other ways to live life. And then there's, you know, things and, you know, there's a compliment to be had outside of where we grew up, which was on the reservation. So that's definitely my motivation to stay on the, you know, straight and narrow. So quick question. So did you guys, I know you got your care out in the community when, uh, when you started therapy, right? So how about you guys? Were you guys inside the VA, outside the VA? Because you've mentioned writing. Um, did you go through any kind of uh, structured therapy? So uh, admittedly, I didn't turn to the VA, but I've heard great things and I, I'm, I'm, glad it's, I'm glad it's there. But um, for me, I, def, I was blessed to be among my comrades in Southern California, my Marines. You know, they live in Los Angeles, San Diego. We definitely get together and we hash out, you know, old times, what's working for us, what's not. And then not only that, while I was in school, I was, you know, fortunate enough to meet uh, one of my professors, Andreas, 
who is a veteran of the German Army and helped establish a writing group for veterans at Cal State uh, San Bernardino. And we get together every once in a while. We talk about how writing has benefited us. So I definitely have that component of, you know, the veterans around me to, you know, so they can hear me so they because they understand what I've been through. They know what it's like to serve. So I definitely want to put myself in um, amongst other veterans because it definitely helps me stay on the straight now path. Well, as far as me, um, yeah, I lean very heavily on the VA, very heavily. Um, as I said before, when um, I went to the emergency room and then the next day I went to, to Northeast and I was there for seven days. And what they did is set me up with the STAR program. And I started to STAR program and I stayed in the STAR program housing. So I stayed there from May of 2018 until December of 2018. And, and from there, that's when I believe Carmen became my caseworker. And from there, um, we set up a HUD badge for me to move into the veterans, Loma Linda, the Loma Linda veterans apartment complex. And so I live in a veterans community. And on that property, we have caseworkers there for veterans. So yeah, I'm a little spoiled. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> Another conversation. Another conversation. New connections, right? New connections. I mean, but it is it is nice to get involved in, in a program where you don't have to wait weeks for an appointment if you have an urgent, like, um, Carmen wasn't my caseworker. Uh, uh, my caseworker uh, was Corey. Mm -hmm. But it, there was a situation where I was calling and I'm like, look, I need an appointment. And I was getting the runaround from a nurse in a different in a different clinic, and I call, ended up calling Corey, and I was like, I "Need help? Like, I need to be seen. We're going on three weeks, and within 24 hours, I had an appointment." Was there ever a time when you were like, "Nah, man, I don't want to do this therapy anymore," and yeah, and then what made you come back? For me, it's when I was like half in and half out, um, I was slowly starting to reestablish and heal the relationship, um, ma mainly with my oldest daughter, but with all my kids. And um, what made me go all in and stick with it is I'm like, okay, I I'm enjoying having like this pleasant relationship versus like, you know, attitude and eye rolling and, you know, feeling like... Uh, when you can actually like feel their, uh, I don't, disdain's not the word I'm looking for, but like, you know, their frustration with you. It's nice tension to feel in the home. tension. There we go. Yeah. It's it's nice to, it was nice to feel something other than like, oh, so we're just going to pretend I've never messed up and just, you know, let's just move on. But um, yeah, it was continuing to further in rehabilitating those relationships. That's like, it's not worth giving any of the work I've been doing or I'm continuing to do up. Well, and thank you for sharing that, because I think a lot of times that's what we try to do. Yeah. Right? We try to act like everything's fine. Yeah, we had that major blowout last night and said he hated each other and, you know, all this, that, and the third. And then the next morning we try to act like it's okay and it's not. Right. And it takes that motivation to continue, like you shared your daughter, your daughters as well. You shared your nieces and nephews. Do you think, had you not decided to change or continue, those family relationships would be in place now? I think part of anyone who's in recovery journeys, there's definitely a time where you relapse. You know, for me, it was, it almost seemed like a constant. Um, but with with every relapse, you know, you have to. I had I had to find a new way, a new uh, way of healing, a way of coping. So it started with writing, and then if I relapse, okay, I need to find something else. I, let's go to the gym. Let's start hiking. With every situation where I found myself that I was relapsing and going back to the old ways, I had to find something new because. The more coping I, skills I had, the more yeah. therapeutic outlets I had, the more or less likely I am to relapse. And that kept me having reaching out for those modalities, reaching out for those forms of therapy is because of my nieces and nephews and my family, because I want them to see that there's ways of healing that isn't, you know, looking at your phone, which sometimes I'm guilty of as well. But disconnecting, mm -hmm. that's a big thing, disconnecting and just trying to work on myself. Well, and I mean, the relationships wouldn't be what they are. I mean, there'd be 
I mean, there, I mean, there's the connection is there. My kids are always going to be my kids. My mom's always going to be my mom, but I don't think they'd be what they are now. Um, and like you were saying, re- relapse happens, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like falling down a giant hill and just be like, oh, really got to climb it again. Mm. Um, it's exhausting. It, it's exhausting. And the coping skills really, really play a significant role because, you know, instead of like spiraling, you know, you, you can like distract, put your mind on other things. Um, you know, instead of focusing on what you're stressing over, that's causing you to unravel, stop, go do something else. Um, and that's been the biggest thing is like give, keeping myself busy. That helps in a positive, in a positive way. Right. Absolutely. Um, I definitely, that's one of the things I try to do is keep myself, um, busy because, um, even though I was in the Starbucks program for about 18, 19 months, I relapsed. I relapsed on uh, January 1st, 2020. And it was a it was a choice that I personally had made because my brother passed on that day, my only brother. And um, and so I made a conscious choice on the way home to stop by the store, give me a bottle and et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, I dug that hole again for myself in that rabbit hole is where I stayed. And I stayed in that rabbit hole for about, about a year almost, about a year almost. And um, that's when my daughter and I got together and we called, well, my therapist actually from the VA called this treatment center called Banyan Treatment Center. And I was admitted to Banyan Treatment Center in Palm Springs. So what keeps me motivated today, like like my battle buddy over here says, is is writing first of all, and plus I I do three Zoom meetings with Banyan every week, alumni Zoom meetings. I do three alumni Zoom meetings every week, every week, and one of those Zoom meetings is a veterans Zoom meeting on Mondays, and so it's just veterans talking about our addictions and what we're going through. So that keeps me motivated. Um, I'm also taking guitar lessons with Mario, uh, the gentleman that was over here playing the guitar earlier. Yeah, he he gives guitar lessons. That's another thing that I do that helps me. I meditate. That's another thing that motivates me. I go to the gym. I haven't been in a bit, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm working on that. I'm working on that. So I, I try to do things that are positive and optimistic for myself. And that's what helps keeps me sober and, you know, mentally strong and physically strong as well. I think a lot of times when people are starting their recovery, right, we we want it fast. We wanted it yesterday. We don't want to wait. We don't want to do a bunch of work, right? What would you say to somebody who's kind of on that early phase, in that early phase of like, I, I, I went to one session and I don't, I don't think it's for me. I don't day. <laughs> you repeat that? Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, you, you can't walk. I mean, that's like walking into, okay, this is going to be like the most ridiculous analogy. You can't walk into Home Depot, buy a pile of wood, buy some nails, go to a lot, set it down, and expect the house to build itself. You have to put it that is a great analogy. I was just about to say, I don't think that was a ridiculous analogy. I am They're totally wonderful. going to steal that. Same. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's it. And uh, another thing that was a real big, um, a real big like push forward that I would recommend is something that I started used to say when I started like really, really seriously started uh, focusing on getting help and doing the work was don't focus on what's behind you. Don't look back. You're not going that direction. So um, straight ahead, arrow, straight ahead. Like that one too. <laughs> the world in the rear view mirror exactly. doesn't shake me. Exactly. What about for you two? What would you say to somebody in that early phase of recovery? Well, instant gratification is worthless, first of all. So it takes work. It takes time. It takes patience. Um, that's where a lot of meditation comes in for me. You know, it's just relaxing. Uh, some people say, let go, let God. So let go, let your higher power or whomever you believe in. You know, you can't, you can't 
force things to happen. You know, and like I tell my children all the time, everything happens for a reason. So you have to be patient with yourself and take it day by day. If you can't take it day by day, take it hour by hour. If you can't take it hour by hour, take it one minute at a time. But you have to be patient with yourself is what I would say. One thing that just came to me right now as I, I heard one of my colleagues talking was that uh, joining the Marines, I didn't become a Marine in one day. It took three months of boot camp to get me to earn that title, and I was very proud of that. So I would definitely use that analogy for anyone who's you know a veteran wanting to get better. It, it, it's, it's not the next day. Instant gratification, I, I think we're kind of spoiled as Americans. We definitely, there's a lot of, with te especially with technology, you know, there's Amazon, things like that. <laughs> but, you know, earning that title of, you know, sobriety, earning that title of, you know, recovery is definitely going to, you know, take some time. So definitely, you know, understand that it's going to be that process and it's not an easy one, but you'll definitely get there. The, the other thing too is not, um, you know, actually be sincere about it because if you're just like okay i got an appointment today okay they want me to journal this um that gets you nowhere you're just you're literally just going through the motions if you literally i mean it is blood sweat tears heart body soul everything if you are not 150 percent committed you're wasting your time until you're serious there's you know don't don't waste you know your own time and the time of others just to go through the motions and not do anything with it. Very well said. Can I elaborate on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Do it for yourself. Um, because you know, I, I've been in treatment, like I said, I've been in treatment centers and I've I've heard and seen people say, Oh, I'm doing this for my kids, I'm doing this for my wife, I'm doing this for so and so, I'm doing this for so and so. If you're not doing it for yourself, for me personally, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. And I know it may sound selfish. It may sound selfish, but I have to do this for myself in order for me to be a better person for my children. And that's where it lies with me, just yeah. doing it for yourself. I think it kind of is like that airplane analogy, right? When they say if there's an, an emergency, the masks will drop and you do what? You put yours first. Because if you faint and you have to take care of the little one, now, now you're both in trouble, right? right. And so it was interesting because I think the two of you have that relationship of children, and even though they're not your children direct, it's your niece and your nephew, or nieces and nephews. And so I think there's definitely some of that uh, we're seeing, right, in the three of you, your individual experiences, that it's for the younger ones too. I think that can be very motivating, and it gives you a sense of like being that mentor, that role model, not just because I'm mom or dad or uncle, but more more than that. And so I thank the three of you for sharing that piece that stood out to me. Sounds like you each kind of had to face the darker version of yourself mm -hmm. and, and, um, and keep going. So, you know, what would you say to somebody who's like, I don't want to face it? I know that's a tough, heavy one. one. Yeah. Sorry. I just took it down. Yeah. The only way, the only way out is through. That's what my my uh, my phrase is that I go to. The only way out is through. If I'm going to get through this dark times, I have to go through it. If I'm going to, you know, reach my goals, I have to climb the mountain to get there. You know, there's no easy way but through. I would say. And that was my mine is similar. It's grow through what you go through. You just have to growing pains. You have to. I mean, if you have no emotion, you feel nothing. You are so numb to the point where you're like, you're so complacent with. Okay, if it happens, it happens, whatever. Oh, death is next. Okay. Um, I mean, if you're at that point, you really have, I mean, that's the tipping scale. I mean, if you have like no desire to thrive forward, you're just doing nothing. You're 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 going nowhere. Um, and that's that's the point, probably the most dire emergent point where you need to really just step up and say, okay, I really don't want to make this call, but my options are get help or death. I think sometimes too, when we're facing the darker version of ourselves, we have to just accept it. We have to just kind of accept like what has happened, you know, and, and then kind of be like, you know, the past behind me, right. You know, and that it's not going to define me anymore, you know, um, and it's really inspiring to hear from the three of you. It really is because this is this is a journey. 
you know, it's not, it's not easy. It's, you know, you have to go through, you have to go through. I was just about to ask that, you know, like you you said, it's a journey. And one of the words that I heard you say was earning that title of recovery. Do you think you ever are fully recovered perfectly? I never need anything Um, ever again. I, you know, I would say, I would say, yes, I think, I mean, an addict is always going to be a recovering addict. An alcoholic is always going to be a recovering alcoholic. But I think too much is put into the titles because then it's always like, oh, let's remind, let's remind that person that you had faults, that, you know, you were less than perfect. Bring me one perfect person and then you can put my faults at my feet and judge me for them. Um, I think, yes, I think you just need to be like, look, I had, I had a past, I made mistakes, um, but I can't focus on that. Because if I focus on that, then I'm going to start to feel bad. And when you start to feel bad, you have self-doubt and then the dark, then the dark thoughts start to creep in and just everything tries to like pull you back to that awful spot. For me, it's like, you know what? (laughs) I have an awful past. I made a lot of mistakes. Like Gina was saying, kind of accepting. Accepting. Not saying it was okay, but accepting. And I'm I'm yeah. I'm gonna botch this, but I uh, I had a uh, care provider, um, and I'm gonna mess up the order. But accept, admit, apologize, move on. Wow. Okay. I'm kind of like very that. cool. Yeah, I do. I like I that. All else. kinds of things Dude. that I'm gonna steal from right, the channel. Right, right, right. So our future our future veterans can I, thank the three of I, you. You, could, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> you, do, you do. And glad to hear that you're utilizing it. Like we said, half of the battle is following up. Mm-hmm. And moving forward. And I kind of heard you say dangerous territory when I asked that question. What do you mean by that? So I kind of forgot the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you ever fully recovered? Got it. Okay. So I definitely always have my guard up. I I I'm okay where I'm at now, but I don't want to over congratulate myself because right. then the thoughts, what's another, you know, this or that, you know, and then I'm back where I started again. So I definitely always have to be on my guard and you know realize who i'm around and you know continue to distance myself and make sure that you know i'm sticking to what i know because it you know it could change so fast and everything can be derailed so fast so i definitely always have to have my guard up when it comes to that because that is dangerous territory to think i'm okay and you know i'm never it's never going to happen again because it could very well easily happen again so talking about change and talking about like um people that you're around um Did you guys have to change? What were the biggest changes you guys had to make in your environment? Well, for me, it's um, about who I hang out with or who who I surround myself with. And I, um, I, I preach, you know, Surround yourself with sober-minded people, yeah. like-minded people. You know, you you can't you can't call yourself being sober. For me personally, I can't call myself being sober constantly hanging around someone that uses. I mean, that's that's just ridiculous. I mean, I know I'm you know I'm strong, but why would I put myself in that situation? And um, so it's very for me that's like very dangerous. So I, I I watch the people that I hang around and I watch the things that I do and the things that I say, because I like to practice what I preach and live by my word. And that's, yeah. How do you find these people? Oh. <laughs> the, the party. You know, at the bar, like, where, where do you go? Where do you go? <laughs> oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's, oh, that's easy right there. Um, yeah, like I said, you know, I met a lot of people in recovery. I'm still, I still communicate with a lot of people I went to recovery with. And of course, uh, some people have gone back to their addictions. Some people have passed away that I that I've met in recovery, you know, which is really sad because of their addiction. But um, yeah, I met quite a few people that I'm still in touch with that I met in the STAR program. Um, I met quite a lot of people uh, from all over the the country uh, when I was in the Banyan program. And you know, I, like I said, I do my Zoom meetings three times a week. And one of the things that I love about Banyan is they have alumni events like every couple of months. Yeah. So we all get together, go bowling, you know, and they're having a Halloween party next month. So <laughs> that's how I surround myself with sober minded people. Um, for me, I started I mean, I have a big social anxiety. 
issue. And for me, um, I started little by little going to a monthly women's veterans luncheon um, that Trinity Veteran hosts. And I like at a toe in, I, I would go very sporadically because I'd be uncomfortable. Then I did a social anxiety group. And from there, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to dive head first. And now I'm every opportunity I get to go to a veterans event, whether it's fishing up in Oxnard or Channel Islands, I'll go um, lunch, I'll go, you know, just here. here. Yeah, excuse me, here. <laughs> you know, um, for me, it started with me shrinking my tribe like this, mm. Um, mm. really finding out who was really my, like, who's really my friend, who's, mm. who's really um, genuine. Um, because it's very easy to get sucked into um, situations where it's like, oh, you know, I can go hang out, I'll be fine. And then you're like, well, everybody else is doing it, it's fun. And I have fear of missing out, like, come on, FOMO for sure, let's go. Sure. Um, and then you get sucked right back in. So for me, it was shrinking my, my who surrounded me really small. Um, and now almost all the, if it's not a family function, almost every other function I'm a part of is veteran related. So how do you find some of these things? How did you figure out this Trinity women veterans? Cause I think that's part of the struggle, right? It's like, how do you find these places? Right. Well, and those are also not from the VA either. They're veteran veterans, but not VA. So it sounds like you're utilizing your community as well. A friend of mine, um, the gentleman who started uh, Trinity veteran is um, like, a, is like a family is like family to her. And I was struggling with some other stuff veteran related. Um, she kept saying, oh, call this person, call this, call, call, call. And I wouldn't. So she had him call me. Oh. And so then little by little, I was like, well, if I'm going, I'm going to take a, a friend with me and who happens to be the wife of a veteran. And so we started doing, you know, going to the luncheons. And um, when she moved up to Big Bear, I was like, oh, I'm myself. So <laughs> I just, you know, I, I started uh, going with uh, another, another friend started going with me. And then from there, it's like, now I'm telling neighbors, you know, t telling their yeah. wives, like, hey, you don't have to be the veteran. It's vet connected. It's for women veterans and vet connected women. Um, I mean, we, there's gals there who I, I believe um, it's like their great grandfathers were veterans. Um, and, you know, they come and they get involved and it is, it's pleasant. But from there, Trinity Veteran introduced me to Mission Fish. Um, and I believe Mission Fish is based out of Victorville, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But that's how I got to go on an all expense, you know, all paid fishing trip in Oxnard. Mm -hmm. um, stayed at Port Wainimi uh, the night before, hopped on a boat, like six out. It was so much fun. And you're, and you're able to build your support network even right. brighter and than it already was. Like, I, I flat out said, I'm not fishing. I ended up, you know, <laughs> it's, it wasn't because I didn't want to or didn't sure. know how. Sure. Um, it was, there were a couple of other veteran gals that went with me. And I was kind of helping, but it was um, it was a it was a function to do while establishing relationships and building on them. Um, but they're not just for women. That trip in particular was just women. Yeah. Um, but they do co-ed. They do just men. It is it's just so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. What about for the two of you? Any other communities? I knew you shared about um, Brandman. Uh, Banyan. 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 But what about any other? community supports that you've utilized as part of your recovery journey? So, um, I believe you mentioned the writers, the writers um, club, the veterans writers club. Yeah, we're, uh, we're both a, a part of that. Yeah, and um, so that that's another outlet that, that uh, helps me and keeps veterans and keep us together. <laughs> Working together. Yeah. Um, you know, my circle's definitely small as far as when it comes to reaching out for help. So I think, you know, aside from the groups or the support, I, as of lately, I just, I try to take time to be okay with being by myself and learning how to, you know, keep on this journey, you know, when not everyone's easily available, you know, so taking the time to, you know, who know, understand who I am and what I want to do and try to start that, you know, even when I'm alone. If we, even if, you know, it's just me and my partner and, you know, setting goals for myself and reaching them and, you know, building confidence in myself and learning to like myself, you know, whether I'm with someone with um, a group of people who are in recovery or whether I'm alone, you know, those have to kind of go hand in hand because 
if you kind of isolate yourself, then that's where the trouble begins again. So I definitely have to build better habits with just being by myself and, you know, taking the time away just to, you know, ensure that I'm doing okay and not just grasping onto everyone as I used to do. So I was going to build off that. You need to first and foremost, learn to be okay being alone. But you also scary. have to it is really scary, but, and then you have, you know, it's like, it's like all these little steps. You have mm -hmm. to learn to be okay being alone, whether it's like you were saying romantically or just, you know, in a group of friends, you have to be okay. Because if you just like, you know, just reach out and latch on, or like grab a hold of people, you're going to like attract the wrong crowd. You have to be okay. You have to learn to be okay asking for help. I still struggle every day. I will wait until my house could be on fire and I will still try and put it out myself. Before I'm going to wait till that long. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you, so, you know, with, with it's, you just have to comfort, you know, find your own, find not just inner peace. You have to, you have to make your inner peace, your outer peace. Um, you know, there's maybe, another one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> But really, that truly, it's recorded. Okay. <laughs> you know, hey, what do we say about communication, right? About about writing, writing it out. No, I mean it. It is make yeah. make, make your you know make your outsides match your insides. You know, it's just start start with yourself. Slowly branch out. That way, you always you know without over controlling the situation, you at least have control of who you know has a an effect on your life. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to anybody like who's going to go through this? Like, like any, you guys have lots of like little one liners. It's great if we, you know, but like what, what advice would you give them? Trust the process. Know it's worth it. Um, and, and I mean, and understand if, if you, if you're at your rock bottom and you are acknowledging your rock bottom, what else do you have to lose? Definitely take a chance, you know, everything doesn't always seem as interesting at first glance. You know, I didn't really care to want to talk to a civilian, you know, in a therapy setting, but I, after a while I took a chance and it kind of worked out for the better. You know, I didn't think I was a, that great of a writer, but I took a chance and, you know, I'm, I published two screenplays, a collection of poems, and I'm working on my first novel, you know, so definitely take a chance on something that might help you and try to expand that. Because you're worth it. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm 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 a big advocate for um, the VA, the uh, the health, the mental health here. You know, I'm a I'm a big advocate. So I will I would always refer them to the VA if they're a veteran, first of all. And then I'm a big advocate of Bayon uh, Treatment Center as well because. I mean, it was just awesome, you know, just th their program, how they had everything set up. So I would definitely advise anyone that I know, and I have advised quite a few people that I know that are struggling with addiction to um, either the VA or the Banyan Treatment Center. What does recovery look like today for the three of you? Just learning who I am, you know, remembering that you know there's people cheering for me and that there's people who are watching me that wanted to see me succeed and knowing that gives me comfort you know knowing that I job I have a job that I love you know I love helping other people and to you know give whenever someone says thank you you know I take that to heart and just you know going home at the end of the day and being happy with what I do and with happy with who I am you know that's what recovery looks like for me for me, uh, recovery looks very good, <laughs> um, and I and I honestly say this: it it looks very good for me right now because I am two years, two months sober, you know. And uh, appreciate that, appreciate that, <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it, life is a roller coaster, you know. But um, with the support system that I have, you know, my my daughter that I mentioned earlier, 
<laughs> and my best friend over here, you know, they they have my back. So that that helps my that, that helps me in my recovery. Um, being who I am, doing what I want to do, uh, like this gentleman here, you know, I'm I'm an author as well, you know, and I have my own publishing company. Um, so I'm doing well, you know, I'm I'm living life and I'm feeling great about it. I don't have to worry about the night sweats anymore. I mean, if you go through an addiction and then you stop, you'll know what I'm talking about. But you don't want to get to that point. Believe me. Um, I mean, recovery for me, like the probably the best part of it all is I am a thousand percent more involved with my family. Like I'm not being like, you know, I and when I'm there, I'm a hundred percent more present. Um, I have great relationships established with my, with my daughters, especially, um, I, they, we actually like talk, you know, used to be like, oh, mom's here. Okay. We actually have phone, you know, we talk a couple times a week. Um, you know, they'll just call for random, random silly bits of advice. And I'm like, it's, it's nice. It is so nice, um, to, to be someone that they can rely on now and not someone that's like. You know, can we just like put her behind a curtain type of deal? You know, um, I've got, um, I mean, all my relationships family wise have, uh, have strengthened and, um, are really nice. That's great. I bet that that just warmed my heart. I saw a pretty I saw that reaction. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I just felt emotions. <laughs> Ew, what are you, a social worker? Oh my God. <laughs> you're not? And you're not. No, you know what, 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 as you were sharing that, and thank you for that, because what I was thinking is it sounds like you're creating bonds, not relations. It's, that's what I mean, No, but really, right? Like like you said, you're not, oh, mom's here. It's like, right. oh, wow, mom's here. Like, hey, mom, yes. let's talk. Let's, let's yeah. eat, you know, mother, daughter, and, and friend, and whatever other layer there is. I mean, and it's, 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 I've got both sides of the coin, because I've got a completely reconstructed, um, stronger relationship and bond with my own mom. So, <laughs> hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's man, I did all good until this point. That's uh, okay. Crying doesn't make you weak, it makes you human. Oh, and no. I know to the veterans over here, context blurry. <laughs> <laughs> to the veterans, you're trained not to show that. So. You know, uh, it's to, to have the bonds there. And I mean, it used to, you know, I can just vividly just a billion thoughts run through my head of all, you know, of, or a billion of all the old thoughts that used to run, that used to run through my head. And I mean, I look at all the established, you know, reestablished relationships and bonds and connections made. And it's, it's like, I feel like I'm a hundred percent, a completely different person. I mean, I'm different. Yes. Yeah. But I, I look yeah. back, you know, briefly and I'm like, I don't even know who that was. You don't recognize yourself anymore, at all in a good way, in a very good way. The only thing you have to change is everything. I mean, there's lose nothing. <laughs> you have nothing to lose by changing, right? Right. Are there any other words of wisdom or thoughts that you would like to share? Anything that 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 made a huge difference? Something that was like this was the moment, or this was the thing, or this was the person, this was the statement. love yourself that that would have to be i mean that's that's where you need to start is love yourself love yourself so much that you know you change everything for the better find a mentor find a mentor who's you know gone through the same struggles you have ask them how they did it and then when you're ready be a mentor to someone else and share with them your experiences um have the strength to break generational curses oh yeah yeah because i think i am a trendsetter <laughs> for my family you know uh, um because yeah there was a lot of addicts in my family and and it's so scary growing up you don't realize the dysfunction the trauma, you think it's normal because you're a child. But when you grow up, you learn better, you do better. 
break those generational curses, you can do it. Well, and I appreciate the the tidbit of finding a mentor. I, I don't know about you, but I think we have three really good ones available. Maybe, maybe just a plug. Just saying. Could be wrong. We've got know. a lot of great one-liners. <laughs> well, I think this kind of wraps it up. You know, we really, really appreciate you guys being brave enough to be vulnerable with us today, because that takes it takes a lot of strength to come up here with the spotlight in your face. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And and share some of the darkest, but also the best of you. Because it takes true strength and courage to keep going. And I'm so proud of all of you guys, especially you, Amber. I've known you a while. And so thank you so much. We really appreciate it. As a civilian on the table. <laughs> right. I appreciate again the vulnerability. No benefits. All right. So while we get set up for our next part here, I uh, I think Gina said it really well. But uh, once again, we want to thank our three panelists for being so vulnerable and for sharing that information. Um, it's not always easy to do, but we do appreciate it. All right. So when we were planning for this. When we were planning for this, one of our planning committee members said, hey, don't use acronyms because nobody nobody knows what they mean. Well, I'm about to throw some acronyms at you, so I'm sorry, Andres. <laughs> so um, the, the Mental Health Summit is typically planned by somebody uh, known as a local recovery coordinator. And we've had some turnover at this position. It's been vacant for a little bit, but we're very fortunate to have just recently had somebody come into the role and we're really excited for him. You can see him up here. He's also just over here this is Mr. Brian Brewer. So I'm gonna read a little bit about Mr. Brian Brewer, but first, could we give him a hand? There's a lot of responsibility that comes along with being a local recovery coordinator. And I know that Brian is the perfect man for the job. So let me go ahead and read his bio real quick. Brian Brewer is an MSW. LSCSW is currently serving as a local recovery coordinator, mental health supervisor within the suicide prevention section. He served in the United States Marine Corps, return, retiring in 2011 as a master sergeant. During his 20 year military career, he participated in three Iraqi freedom and Southwest Asia military campaigns. He was awarded with the Navy Marine Commendation Medal and Meritorious Service Medal, amongst other service and campaign awards. Following his military service, he worked as a government program manager attached to a Marine Corps uh, base camp, Pendleton. In 2017, he began his social work career, achieving his master's degree in social work from Azusa Pacific University in 2017. He interned with the VA Loma Linda since 2016, and he began his career at the VA serving as an emergency department social worker from September 2017 until September 2020. During that time, Mr. Brewer served in various roles such as suicide prevention champion, emergency department homeless champion, or an emergency department homeless champion. He was involved in crisis intervention, medical, social work, and psychiatric assessment. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me start over here. See, see, that's why we use acronyms. If we had acronyms, that would have gone very smoothly. Um, so in his role, he was introduced as the severe mental illness or SMI population as he assessed and provided psychiatric recommendations. He was later employed as the Mental Health Intensive Case Management or MICM coordinator from September 2020 to September 2023, where he served as the SMI veteran population within their communities and led an interdisciplinary team of mental health clinicians. In his role, in this role, he was also involved in the Early Psychosis Intervention Coordination or EPIC program, serving as the VA Loma Linda point of contact. In his free time, he enjoys traveling, spending time with family and friends, weightlifting, and focusing on his physical fitness, which sounds very Marine of him. So we're gonna give him some we're giving him an opportunity to share a few words with us. So let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Brian Brewer. Thank you, thank you. I wasn't uh, wasn't aware I was going to give a speech, but 
I'm always good to give uh, good hip pocket training, you know, um, just pull it out and uh, give it to you guys. Um, I want to say this is an awesome role as the local recovery coordinator. And those uh, who don't know what the local recovery coordinator is, um, it's a simple role. It's for people who, uh, an individual who reaches out to people lost in care um, in the communities, um, also uh, high risk veterans um, in the communities, kind of identifying them and trying to, um, you know, give them care or, uh, you know, um, advocate for them, um, reach out, uh, connect them to various VA services here um, that we have to offer. And uh, it was tremendous that everybody came out here because a lot of these uh, resources that are out here are things that um, the local recovery coordinator shares with veterans in the community um, as they try to advocate and bring them back into the uh, care of the VA. Um, another great uh, part of this job is um, to be the subject matter expert for the peer support uh, uh, specialists here at the VA. Um, and that's a crucial role. Um, anybody know what peer support specialists do here? Okay, so we know. So I, what I will say is um, um, peer support specialists here are veterans uh, with lived experiences that can assist veterans uh, uh, you know, in recovery, helping them uh, navigate the VA and just navigating their, their lives. Um, and when I say lived experience, um, you know, it, it can be a gamut of things that um, um, veterans been through. You know, I'm a veteran myself um, and we can share some of the experiences you know, that, that peer can actually share that experience and work, and they can see what the peer uh, peer been through and what they've accomplished. And so sometimes seeing that, um, like at the table, uh, you talked about recovery, um, it's many different facets, it's client-centered, um, it looks different to each person. And so what that peer does is kind of brings that together for that veteran in a system where other clinicians or therapists can't do. And so I think the peers are much needed. And I just want to say that, uh, we're going to be hiring uh, for peer support specialists here at the VA Loma Linda. We actually have, uh, I think, six or seven um, uh, openings that are going to be happening. So if anyone's, uh, if you know anybody um, that is, uh, you know, good to go for that role, um, just please look at USA Jobs. Um, that position will be available. All right. And that's pretty much all I have. So thank you guys. So next. I want to take a, a minute to introduce um, someone that has been behind the scenes and really helps to empower us to do these types of things. Uh, she doesn't like any attention or credit. Um, and so I could already see her being uncomfortable with what I'm saying right now. So uh, I want to introduce Ms. April Garza. She's an LCSW and she is the Suicide Prevention Program Coordinator. And um, I will say that she does an amazing job of empowering her team. I could talk for about a half hour of the stories that I heard from uh, people that work for her and how amazing it is to have a supervisor that supports you the way that she does. So anyway, that being said, let's get her up here and, and hear a few words from her. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, and thank you all of you who have come out for our annual mental health summit. We're so excited that we were able to have it in person this year um, after three wonderful but virtual um, summits over the last few years. Um, I have the distinct honor and privilege of making a special presentation, and I hope this person has hung around. Um, someone make sure? Okay. So, so Brian Brewer was talking about the importance of the role that our peer support specialists play um, here at VA Loma Linda and at VAs across the nation um, and on all of our treatment teams um, within mental health. And I, I just can't overstate um, the importance of us having peers as part of all of our teams. And I'm very encouraged um, with our facility's decision to fund six new VHIP peer positions in fiscal year 24, which starts on October 1st. Um, this, is, this is just huge. Um, as a non-veteran 
myself, um, but definitely a supporter of the VA and all of our programs and all of the veterans that we serve. Um, I have had the personal experience of working side by side with peers. And I'll tell you what, they do something, they bring something very special to the teams that they they work with here at VA and, and to our veteran patients. Um, they bring something that a non-veteran staff member, no matter how many degrees, how many licenses, how many years of experience we have, cannot bring to a veteran who is in crisis or a high-risk veteran or a veteran that's struggling with serious mental illness. Um, so I, for one, am very, very grateful um, for our peers. And we have a long, proud tradition of peers here at VA Loma Linda. We really do. And every year, we are allowed to nominate one peer specialist from VA Loma Linda. Um, they are our facility's VA peer of the year. And then in turn, all of those nominations from within our vision or our, our region to not use an acronym, our region, um, they choose one from our region, which includes um, VA Greater Los Angeles, Long Beach, San Diego, the Arizona VAs, New Mexico um, VA. One peer is selected from all of those nominations from our facilities. And then that nominee goes on to national VA um, nominations. Um, for the VA National Peer of the Year Award. So this year, our facility nominated Mr. Terry Kramer. If Terry would come up here. And Terry is our peer specialist who has worked for a lot of years with PRRC. And he didn't know that we were gonna bring him up here today. It's okay. So Terry actually is our very first VA Loma Linda Peer Specialist of the Year to be chosen as the Vision 22 Peer Specialist of the Year. First time ever. And I'm telling you, we have nominated some amazing peers over the years. He's our first to be named Vision 22 Peer Specialist of the Year for 2023. And to knock it out of the park on the first go round, he made it as a finalist for the VA National Peer Support Specialist of the Year. So I wish it could be like something really great, like a car or a, you know, a big prize. But, <laughs> but we do have a certificate here um a certificate of achievement to mr terry kramer peer specialist and we listed all of the awards va loma linda peer specialist of the year vision 22 peer specialist of the year and finalists for the va national peer peer specialist of the year for 2023 and it's signed by luther e davis dr davis who is our acting um assistant chief of staff for mental health You can stay. Yep, yep, yep. Now, this is really humbling. I mean, even to be recognized as the Loma Linda VA peer is humbling because there are some great, there are some great, great peers here doing the same job I do every day, day in, day out. Somebody said something about being a peer at the Loma Linda. Being a peer isn't just being a peer at the Loma Linda. If you're a peer support, you're, you're a peer support. You're in the community day in, day out. God, thank God I have a beautiful wife that takes care of me because she knows if I see one of these in the community and I'm beelining to it, she might as well go in the car, sit down and turn on the AC. Because I, I, I pick them out. You know, they're, they're out there. They, they, need, they need us to ask those simple questions. How was the VA treating you? When was the last time you've been to the VA? And be ready for the responses. 
because you're going to hear everything from they killed my buddy to, to they saved my dad. And but no, I haven't been there lately. And I love doing it. I love being I love being a peer. Most people know I was I was probably done four years ago. I think William Sackett called me and asked me how come I didn't apply for a, another peer, a peer support job and told him I'm, I was done. I was pretty much retired and I was ready. ready. And I'm 100 percent service connected better. And my wife has a nice job. Why do I need to keep going to work every day? And I was done. And I went ahead and told him if he would offer me the position, I would give him three years. And September would have been four years. And that I don't because because really really where's the pure gonna go? I'm just gonna keep doing the same job and not get and not get paid for it. <laughs> and and I don't know. Most, most peers know the re recognition is good. It's humbling, but it's good. It's always great to be recognized. Recognize all your veterans. Recognize your friends. Even the people who say no, 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 no. We we thrive on it. We love it. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate the award. And thank you for putting this up. So we meant to do this early. Well, I meant to say something earlier as he was still playing. Uh, but we want to take time to thank uh, Mr. Mario Kelly who is also a peer support specialist. Uh, he was the gentleman that was playing music for us as we came in. Um, and so he took that on short notice. We realized we needed some, some nice background music. He said he would do it. And to, to uh, take that even further, uh, for a second, we thought we were gonna need somebody for the national anthem. And I asked him if he could sing the national anthem. And he's like, it ain't gonna be pretty, it's not gonna be pretty, but he started looking up the lyrics for us. So that's, um, that's the type of guy that, that Mario is. Uh, so we want to thank Mr. Mario Kelly, who is a U.S. Navy veteran and a peer support in the HUD Vasher housing program. Um, so we want to hear what you think about the summit. We want to improve them. Um, thank you so much for joining this one. It was our first in person in three years. So we're hoping to grow, make them bigger and better. Um, so you will be getting a survey um, using the email that you use to register for the event. And we just want to hear your thoughts and how we can do better next time. So please take a few minutes to answer that. And again, thank you for joining us. Please stop by our vendors. They're still out there for one more hour. So go and um, check out what they have to offer. And if you guys have any questions, we're going to be around here for a little bit. So please stop by and, and let us know how we can help. Thank you.